four months. Do you have holy water by your bed? Oh, yes. Oh, Already depressed. Yeah. Oh, amen. Oh. Do, why, why do you not believe anything I say? <laughs> Eamon Holmes back on GB News Breakfast at 6 a.m. Every weekend, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Bigger and better, starting at 8pm Friday and Saturday. Can't be too safe. Bring it on. Has there ever been a more innuendo feed you? And Sundays, we're on at nine. It's ridiculous. Just, just get on with it. Maybe you should get a proper job. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubry, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing, go on. He's probably gonna want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like on Jubes and Co. Come and join us, GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubry, weekday evenings at six o'clock. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. Yes. We'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, good evening, and welcome along to Neil Oliver Live on GB News TV and on the radio set. Tonight, I'll discuss controversial plans to add fluoride to drinking water across England and Wales. There's reaction as well to the Department for Education's latest guidance on remote learning, homeschooling for school children. And in a few minutes, I'll give my thoughts on why the introduction of digital ID for everyone in the UK is a terrible, terrible idea. All of that and more coming up. But first, an update on the latest news from Ray Addison. Thanks, Neil. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. 276 Flybe staff have been made redundant, with the airline going into administration for the second time in three years. Around 75,000 holidaymakers have had their bookings cancelled. The UK Civil Aviation Authority is urging them not to travel to airports. Flybe returned to the skies last April after collapsing in 2020. They operated flights to 17 destinations. Flybe travellers say they're disappointed to see their flights cancelled. Um, I looked on my emails and then I saw um, in big bold letters, your flight is cancelled. And my first thought was, this has got to be a prank, surely, because it's the day of the flight. Last night, I was able to print this off, you know, the boarding pass. It doesn't say anything about, you know, we're going into administration. They even said when I was doing it, oh, do you want to book an extra bag? Thank God I never, as, you know, I'd be owing them that. A murder investigation has been launched after a 15-year-old girl was fatally stabbed in Hexham. The 16-year-old boy is also in hospital after suffering serious but not life-threatening injuries. Northumbria police say it follows a suspected assault. Another 16-year-old boy has been arrested and remains in custody. Sir Keir Starmer says Labour has reformed under his leadership. Addressing the London Labour conference, he told members they must show voters the party is different to the one that Britain rejected at the 2019 general election. He also promised to put the country first and warned party members against complacency. Britain is crying out for change, crying out for decisive leadership, and we must provide it. Prove that we can be a bold, reforming government. Show not just what the Tories have done to Britain, but the Britain that Labour can build. A fairer, greener, more dynamic country, with an economy that works for everyone, not just those at the top, and a politics which trusts communities with the power to control their own destiny. 
Well, we spoke to former minister, Lord Peter Mandelson. He says Labour must stay focused on the next election. The biggest risk is that we think that the next election's in the bag, that we relax, we take it for granted. No, no, no. We have to maintain our absolute focus on voters, particularly those voters who have yet to be convinced that Labour does uh, offer uh, a credible, united, progressive alternative for our country. The head of the RMT union says its members will decide by the 8th of February whether to accept the latest and final pay offer from the rail delivery group. Mick Lynch says discussions will be held with members across the country over the next 10 days. He told GB News the terms are not great and he doesn't feel optimistic. What we've got is a really poor offer. The pay offer is below less than half of the rate of inflation over these two years. Inflation is running over 22-23% in the retail price index. This is 9% over two years. And we had no offer for three years before that. So this, our people are getting poorer, and at the same time, their conditions and their working lives are being trampled all over. So I'm quite uh, suspicious about what's going on, and I don't know if our members would be prepared to accept it. Graphic body cam footage has been released in the United States showing police in Memphis beating a black man who died three days later. Now, a warning, some people may find the following footage distressing. Gary! Mom! Mom! Hey. Gary! 29-year-old Tyree Nichols was kicked, punched and pepper sprayed as he cried out for his mother. Five black officers have been sacked and are facing murder charges. President Joe Biden says he's outraged and he's called for an end to police misconduct. Well, back here, a former Conservative Party chair says a number of members feel they were denied a vote on Rishi Sunak becoming Prime Minister. In an interview with GB News, Sir Jake Berry said Mr Sunak should have held an endorsement vote during the leadership contest to show he had the support of the membership. I think even though he absolutely got the majority of members of parliament, the Conservative members of parliament, and, you know, I support him as Prime Minister and everything he does, there is a challenge he has, is even if it's not true, there's a perception of the Conservative Parliamentary Party now being disconnected from our membership because we didn't have that, even if it was a sort of endorsement vote. And you can see that full interview with Sir Jake Berry on Gloria Meets. That's tomorrow at 6pm. Tributes are being paid to Claire Drakeford, the wife of Welsh First Minister Mark Drakeford, who died suddenly this afternoon. The Prime Minister is among those who passed on his heartfelt condolences to Mark Drakeford and his family. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, and the Prince and Princess of Wales said they too were sending their thoughts and their prayers during their, this difficult time. We're on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. You're watching and listening to GB News. Back now to Neil Oliver Live. Thanks, Ray. You'll have heard of the old bait and switch. It describes a fraud where a company advertises one thing, something that sounds highly desirable, which is the bait. But when a mug actually makes a purchase, they get sold something else entirely, something they wouldn't have wanted in a million years. That's the switch. You see an offer for a luxury coat at a knockdown price. When you try and buy it, you're told they're all sold out, but here's one at twice the price. That's bait and switch, and it's illegal. Bait and switch is all around us. Insects in food. Remember when, waiter, there's a fly in my soup was the start of a joke? Well, now the joke is well and truly on us, and the flies aren't just in the soup, they'll be in the bread and all the rest. They tell us we can save the planet by not eating meat. That's the bait. They push plant-based foods and tell us they're the healthier option anyway, even though anyone who's looked at the ingredients on the side of a pack of vegan sausages knows you need a chemistry degree to decipher them. And then there's the bugs. Eat crickets, the Hollywood A-listers tell us. It's better for the environment. But replacing other sources of protein with crickets means a lot of crickets. It's been estimated that it takes 363,000 crickets to match the calorie count of just one cow. 
We eat billions of land animals and trillions of sea animals every year. Stop all that and it's going to take a lot of sheds full of a lot of crickets. Just think of the energy needed to breed and keep all those insects. Maybe think about the genetic modification. Stop to wonder about some of the viruses and diseases insects carry. Where could it all go wrong? And yet still the bait is that a third of a million bugs are preferable to one grass-fed cow. And anyway, if crickets are, let's say, safe and effective, why not just tell us we're going to be eating them? Don't slyly turn them into powder and slip them into the food supply under a Latin name no one understands. Tell the truth out there in the light where everyone can see it. The EU have passed legislation to have crickets cooked into powder and added to all manner of foods. In the EU's own legislation, the list is long. Everything from cereal and bread to meat, cheese, beer and sweets. Even now, the presence of crickets won't be obvious. It won't say crickets on the packaging. It will say Ashitus domesticus, which is Latin for house cricket. In the end, the bait and switch is in governments and corporations shouting from the rooftops they are working to save the planet and make us healthier. But what do we end up with? Food cut with insect powder we're not supposed to notice. I say the claim that any of this is to improve our health or save the planet is a fraud and a hoax. Electric vehicles are another bait and switch. There are an estimated 30 million fossil fuel cars in Britain. That's not counting the trucks that move all the commodities. There's a quarter of a million of those as well. We're invited to think that one fine day, every one of those dirty old gas guzzlers will be replaced with a shiny new electric alternative. Forget it. That lofty notion is just the bait. The switch is the reality. Most of us won't have any sort of car at all. Unless the demand for cars, any sort of cars, drops drastically, there's no way to hit the emissions targets our governments have loudly committed us to. That's where the 15-minute cities come in. We'll be expected to walk or cycle. Do you see the scam yet? They advertise a world of electric cars, but what we'll end up buying is lives lived on foot within 15 minutes of our homes. Round the corner from where I live, the council installed a rank of electric vehicle charging points. The electricity in them is free at the moment, has been for months. Anyone who wanted could park up and charge their car for nothing. I say free, but of course there's no such thing as free. Someone was paying, which is to say the poor old council taxpayers of Stirling. Those Teslas and the rest might as well have been taking their charge from the private home they were parked outside while the owner of the house footed the bill. That whole stunt was more bait pushing that illusion that electric cars are the cheap option. Next week, those bays will start charging for the electricity. There's the switch. But the bait has gone bad. More and more people smell something fishy and are waking up to the reality of electric vehicles. It's becoming hard to ignore that those massive batteries full of lithium and cobalt obtained by raping environments and destroying ecosystems, the dirty work done by the poorest of the poor, children included, scrabbling in the dirt with bare hands. Those batteries, which are so wildly energy intensive to make and that can't be recycled when they fail after 20 years, those batteries don't like the cold, which is a bit of a bummer if you live in a country that actually has winter, like here for instance. In winter those batteries lose up to half their charging capacity. Oh dear, what a pity, never mind. There's that switch again. Second-hand car dealers in the main won't touch electric cars. I wonder why. You can't make electric cars with renewable energy. There's literally not enough energy in it. So it takes fossil fuels. In Shanghai, where there's been a large uptake of electric cars, the city's charging points are powered by fossil fuels. The air pollution in Shanghai is on the increase as a result. Save the planet my backside. By the time everyone wakes up, it'll be too late and all the cars that work will be gone. America is sitting on 8 million cubic tonnes of lithium. The US actually led on the development of lithium mines until the 1990s, when they were shut down. The Greens in the US, a group well practiced in embarking upon ruinously expensive legal action, effectively bans lithium mining there. Now 80% of the world's lithium is mined in Australia, Chile and China. China controls half of the world's lithium production and three quarters of the world's lithium battery factories. Wherever it happens and however it's done, mining of any sort is extraordinarily expensive, requires vast amounts of fossil fuel energy and inflicts catastrophic damage. 
Renewable energy, dependent upon the mining of rare metals and minerals like lithium, cobalt, copper, silver and a whole raft of others in mind-boggling quantities, can never be green. Renewable energy's appetites rake the planet every bit as enthusiastically as any other. Except nuclear, of course, but we don't talk about nuclear because Greens don't like the clean, emissions-free energy that is nuclear. I say again, the only solution, the inevitable solution, and the one we're not supposed to know about yet, is no cars. They advertise green energy and electric cars, but what they're selling is environmental damage, more billions for the super-rich, followed by no cars for us, bait and switch. Under cover of all this, the fossil fuel industry will be dismantled and put away. I say the day will come when we look over our shoulders and notice it's gone. By then, it will be obvious that most of us don't have cars either. Finally, we'll ask, how come my home is cold and yet I still don't have an electric car? And back will come the reply, shut up and get on your bike. And the mummy and daddy of all bait and switches comes with digital ID. The bait is the well-tried one, which is convenience, such a tasty carrot. The clock is already ticking on a government consultation exercise about the imposition of digital ID. If you haven't noticed, it's hardly surprising since the government hasn't advertised what it's up to. We have until the 1st of March to go to a government website and make clear how much we feel about what is proposed. If we don't object and in enough numbers, the proposals will become law by the end of the year and digital ID will be real. As always, the large print giveth and the small print taketh away. The bright and crunchy carrot of convenience will seek to reassure you that digital ID will keep you safe and ensure your privacy. The dark side, the enemy inside the Trojan horse, is that every shred of your private data will be shared with any government agency and any so-called stakeholder that wants it. Above all else, know this. The new world into which we are sleepwalking is one of zero trust. Zero trust is not my idea. It's the official foundation of your future. Zero trust means each one of us is regarded as a criminal until we can prove otherwise by exposing every scrap of our data. We will be guilty until we prove our innocence. To shop online, you'll have to use your digital ID to prove you are who you are. Just to read your email, to use online banking, even to open your computer will require your digital ID. You'll be in digital jail until you open it with your digital key. All of this can be connected to your carbon footprint and the rest of your social credit score. Make no mistake, all of it is on the Chinese model that enables the state to watch, track and record everything you do and everywhere you go. The cameras are already in place around us and in our phones and screens alongside the microphones that can listen. All of this can be tied to a central bank digital currency, not actual money you can hide under the mattress, just a digital credit rating monitored before any and every transaction. Imagine a future where artificial intelligence watches you try and charge your electric vehicle or put fuel in your old car and decides you've already emitted too much CO2 this month. Result, no power or fuel for you. Or you try and buy a steak and the AI decides you've consumed enough environment wrecking beef. You can't buy it. Imagine you want to travel to London for a meeting and the AI decides you've tweeted something the government doesn't like. No ticket for you. The usual voices will say all of this is just conspiracy theory, but the past three years have proved that today's conspiracy theory is tomorrow's fact. Here are more facts. All online technology is vulnerable to cyber attack, theft and fraud. Banks and the rest are hacked and defrauded all day, every day. There goes your private data. The consultation document is long and complex. The elderly, those without smart tech, those who struggle with technology and even literacy, will neither find the document nor be able to take part. In no way can they give informed consent. Children and adolescents are at most risk because they cannot give informed consent by definition. Here's the thing. Our governments want digital ID. For the longest time, most of us have been slaves to debt. In the future, we are to be digital slaves. Our every move under round-the-clock surveillance and subject to the yes or no of Big Brother. When it comes to bait and switch, this is the end game. Once digital ID is in place, they won't need the bait anymore because we'll have swallowed it. We have until March. Don't say you didn't know it was happening.
That's my opinion, of course, and feel free to disagree by all means. Keep your tweets and your emails coming all through the show. You can email gbviews at gbnews.uk and you can tweet as well at gbnews. And I'll try to get to some of your comments before the end of the show. I'm joined tonight by Emma Webb, who's the UK's director of the Common Sense Society. How I love the sound of the Common Sense Society. And TV personality Ingrid Tarrant, Hello. another friend of the show. Hello. Ingrid, what do you think of the prospect of your every move being watched round the clock? Everything is just going to fizz, fizzle out in the way that we have lived our lives and been brought up. Everything you say, there's ergo, 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 all down the line. So it is the total control. Um, I find it really scary. What I find perhaps more frightening is that not enough people are recognising this. And I do hope that people that are watching this particular show, actually all your shows, but this particular one, will actually go back and just analyse everything you said one by one by one, because it's showing the complete... Um, how the control in society is going to be global. It's not just here, of course, you know, it's our government and everything. And I don't believe that they're going to look at the figures and do that. Look at... Um, um, oh, God, I, I forget his name, Sa Sadi Khan, sort of like saying, he's completely ignored all the, the people protesting against mm. the, um, the, you know, um, widening the zone. Other exclusions. Yes, you? and it's just been exposed. They're so corrupt, I don't believe anybody and I don't trust anybody anymore. W one thing that I do think is quite nice, you know, with the EV, I'll never get an electric car because then that's another form of control because then there'll be power cuts, we won't be able to charge anything, we won't be able to speak to anyone or do anything like that, so it's isolating people as well. But the walking everywhere, yes, that's the only good thing that would ever come out because nobody walks anywhere, because all the playing fields is gone and everybody hops in a car and it is on your bike, more people are on a bike. But it's that's not the point. You good can luck. encourage people to walk, but you don't have to good do it this way. Good luck walking to Australia to see your relatives. No. <laughs> Emma, the Common Sense Society, how would the Common Sense Society, do you think, react to the idea of this kind of round-the-clock surveillance? Well, I can't speak on behalf of the entire organisation, but I can tell you that my opinion is that, that opposition to this is common sense. Um, I think that, the, as you were saying, with the idea of, of bait and switch, I think you know, the, the, many of the things that you mentioned there, it's a completely false economy. The lithium battery is a perfect example of a false economy. Um, and that people will be enriching themselves off of this green technology. Um, but I can tell you, they won't be the people eating the bugs. They won't be the people who are eating the poor quality food. They will still be able to get their beef and to access their high, high, high nutrition diet. So I think that people need to, to really wake up to the, to the false economy because a, a lot of this stuff is quite complex, isn't it? And so people aren't necessarily aware. They, they hear that being green is a good thing and everybody wants to take care of the environment for sure. But when you actually look into these things, you find out that they're not good for the environment, they're not good for your health. And so I, I, I would say that the, the common sense approach would be for everybody to do their own research, do their own due diligence, because we are living in an increasingly low trust society. And the best thing that you can do is to trust yourself and to trust your own instincts and to trust your own research. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. The first break is already upon us, after which I'll discuss the controversial topic of whether fluoride should be added to drinking water in England and Wales. See you very soon. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations. 
for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Uh, there's responses in already to what's been said so far. Paul says, I'm not eating crickets. I'm just not. <laughs> I'm there with you, Paul. Uh, Twitter user says, uh, the Coast Guy once again saying things that would have other TV stations pulling the plug on him live on air. Splendid. Uh, Valerie says, government deliberately wrecking the economy and police definitely not keeping us safe. Orders from afar. And finally, uh, from another Twitter user, Neil Oliver is going on insects in our food. Good. I can't believe so many people are just sitting there and watching all this BS calmly without anyone else saying anything about it. You go for it, mate. Absolutely great. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> That's lifted my spirits. Uh, now, though, the addition of fluoride to our tap water is a controversial topic. People in around 25 countries drink water with added fluoride, including some 6 million in England. The government has plans to put fluoride in drinking water throughout England and Wales, and a consultation paper will soon be published online. Another one. The whole idea is opposed by many, including my next guest, Joy Warren, who's the national coordinator of the Fluoride Free Alliance UK. Good evening to you, Joy. Thanks for joining me. Good evening. Nice to see you. Why do you object to fluoride in our drinking water? It's a very long list of objections. Um, first of all, um, it's an industrial hazardous waste. It's a pesticide. It's medically unethical. Um, it violates the NHS constitution. Uh, the government is ignoring the serious science, uh, which is basically on our side, and it has chronic health problems. Starting from the top of the body, right down to the bottom, if you like. Well, I'll leave the legs out for now. Um, there are 76 studies which, um, in a century, which show that uh, there's a five to seven IQ points reduction in intelligence uh, when the uh, unborn child and the fetus, uh, sorry, and the infant are exposed to fluoride in the womb and in baby formula made up with fluoridated water. Um, because fluoride affects brain function, it is undoubtedly a developmental neurotoxin, just like lead. Um, and when you look at the six-month-old child having uh, baby formula made up with fluoridated tap water, it's being overexposed by 0.6 milligrams um, per day, or fluoride per day. And that's a huge amount because it's a very tiny atom. And tiny, there's so many million um, atoms in a milligram. Um, and there are other places, you know, talking about the pineal gland. Um, the pineal gland, it silts up with fluoride uh, because it's um, outside the blood-brain barrier. Um, and because of that, the, um, the production of melatonin uh, reduces. You see, and melatonin you see, is very important. Joy, you say it's, a, it's a, an industrial product. Can you, can you give me more detail about exactly where fluoride comes from? Yes, I can. Um, it's imported from the Negev Desert in South East Israel uh, from a company called Israel Chemicals. Um, it's transported across the Mediterranean uh, and lands in um, Tilbury Docks, I believe. But it starts off life as the hazardous waste byproduct of phosphate fertilizer manufacturing. It's not wanted by the people who produce it and it's not produced deliberately. It's just the waste product and they have to get rid of it and they're not allowed to um, let it go out into the air, into the environments. So they wash it out of the chimney in uh, contaminated water, stick it into large tanks 
And that's how it gets to us in the tanks. I don't even think it leaves the tanks all the way from Israel to the fluoridated areas of England. Now, we couldn't, we, we weren't able to uh, attract anyone uh, this evening to, to speak to the other side of this, but I'm, I'm sure the argument would be made that at the levels that it's going into water, that it is safe. You know, how would, how would you, surely the toxicity, the toxicity you describe is about dosage. You, is there a safe dosage of fluoride? Um, the World Health Organization recommends no more than six milligrams of fluoride a day. Um, for babies, of course, they're much smaller and they shouldn't be um, um, exposed to it at all. Um, the Committee on Toxicity has said that babies uh, six months and more should not get more than 0 0.05 milligrams of fluoride per kilo, kilo body weight per day. Um, it, it's, that's not happening. They're getting far more than that uh, in their uh, baby formula made up with fluoridated tap water. The, the, you mentioned the World Health Organization. Also, Chris Whitty, Chief Medical Officer for England, uh, his counterparts in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, they're all in favour of fluoride being added to water. They're not but reading the science. They're not reading the science. No. Who... The, can you back all this up with peer review, with peer reviewed research? I mean, I'm I'm listening to you, but is the is the is the paperwork is the is the scientific documentation the data there at your fingertips? Yes, the last four studies on reduction in intelligence in Canada were peer reviewed, and they they were very robust science. They were four out of seventy six reports which have been uh, produced in this um, century. And 76 reports finding harm, finding reduction in intelligence. It's quite a lot of reports. When it comes, when it comes to, the, to the practicalities of this, can you tell us where is uh, fluoride already in the water supply, in the drinking water uh, in this country, and where is it proposed to be added? Mm -hmm. it, at the moment, it's in West Midlands, Newcastle on Tyne, um, Cheshire, Nantwich, um, a little bit of Bedfordshire, a little bit of Derbyshire, Leicestershire, Nottinghamshire. Lincolnshire is quite comprehensively fluoridated. The proposal this year is to fluoridate uh, the North East, which is the remaining part which is not fluoridated. So Newcastle, North Tyneside and Gateshead are already fluoridated. And so too is a little bit of Northumberland and a little bit of County Durham. And the intention, if they get through the public consultation and don't take any notice of us, is to fluoridate right across County Durham, right up to the border with um, Cumbria and right down to Redcar and right up to Berwick-on-Tweed on the Scottish border. 1.6 million people. Has this consultation uh, process begun? No, they're, they're telling us it's going to happen this year. Um, I'm not quite sure why there's a delay. Uh, they may have to try and work out how to, they can ask the questions in the public consultation. And we don't know if it's going to be one of the strange consultations where you have yes, no, don't know, or whether we're going to be allowed to explain the reasons why we don't want fluoride in our drinking water. Joy, bear with me while I, I speak to my panel here. Uh, Emma, how do you react to the, to the, just to the idea of, of something else being added into uh, a, an unavoidable mm -hmm. supply. You know, we can't yeah. really readily avoid well, drinking water. I, my, my instinct is that people should be able to choose when it comes to something as fundamental as water, you know, they, that should just simply be water that is safe to drink with nothing added to it. Um, I presume that there are arguments for adding fluoride to water. Maybe it's something to do with dental health or something. I'm not sure what those arguments are. Um, but surely that's something that, you know, should be on the choice of the individual. And the idea is, as you say, of, of adding something external to uh, an unavoidable um, supply. You know, mo most people, particularly under the current circumstances, not able to just simply live off of buying bottled water. Um, this, to me, seems to be an infringement of people's rights to choose. And and I, in general, am 
quite sceptical and concerned about anything additional being added chemicals to food, to water, to anything like that. And water is the is the basis of life. Of, of course life. it's got to have some kind of profound impact. Who does the government think they are that they can choose to do this? I, Ingrid, this feels like yet another, after the last two years we've had, this is another instance of someone else taking a decision about what should go into our bodies mm. uh, and, and seeking to make it so, whether we want it or not. Neil, this is really scary. And I'm so glad that I've listened to Joy. When I had my first child, she was born in 1980, and I was living in London, and I, and I moved an awful lot. I said, bought, sold, bought, sold. And I checked, one of the first things that I did when I moved to a new place in a new area was I checked the, uh, the content of fluoride in the water. And if it was lower than the standard, I put fluoride tablets in the water. I did the complete opposite <laughs> of what I was... So my children could have been rocket scientists. Because, really, because if it's diminishing it by, what, 5 to 7% of, um, uh, you know, sort of, like, mental capacity or whatever, and all the disabilities... And where did you get the idea to do that? I don't know. It shows, that's though, that you can choose. It shows that you can choose yeah, to add it if you want to. Yeah, but that's what's so frightening, because I'm really hot on things. I've always been like that all my life. So now that I know how actually dangerous it can be... And, I, and I'm, I've got a thing about teeth and bones and things like that. So it's like, I mean, of course, you get it in the toothpaste. So it kind of made sense. Something at the time, though, back in 1980, was being put out there that I must have picked up on yeah. that it was important to have. So this is scary news. Jo Joy, where can people find out more about fluoride so that they're enabled to make decisions, informed decisions for themselves about what's right for them? Right, OK, so as soon as the uh, consultation is announced, we'll try and get that information out into the, into Newcastle, uh, sorry, into northeast area. And we've, I've got my faithful help sheet here. Can you see that all? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So this is the one dedicated to the northeast, and it'll give people who are interested and concerned. It'll give them all the reasons why they don't want to be fluoridated. Joy Warren they... from <laughs> Joy Warren from the national uh, national coordinator of the fluoride free, fluoride free <laughs> alliance UK. Thank you for your time and thank you for drawing our attention to such an important topic. Thank you for just now. Thank you, Neil. Another break. Gosh, they come around quickly. Uh, I'll be asking after the break why many thousands of shellfish are washing up dead uh, on the shoreline of northeast of England and North Yorkshire. I'll be back shortly. He's the king of breakfast TV and he's back. Eamon Holmes, back on the TV Surprised with me this even morning. even remember my name. No, it's been four months. Oh, you have holy water by your bed? Oh, yes. Oh, Already depressed. Yes. Oh, Eamon. Oh. Why do you not believe anything I say? <laughs> Eamon Holmes, back on GB News Breakfast at 6 a.m. Every weekend, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Bigger and better, starting at 8pm Friday and Saturday. Can't be too safe. Bring it on. Has there ever been a more innuendo feature? And Sundays, we're on at nine. It's ridiculous. Just, just get on with it. Maybe you should get a proper job. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes now. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like on Jubes and Co. Come and join us, GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubry, weekday evenings at six o'clock. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
Join me, Camilla Tomney, at 9.30 on Sunday morning when I'll be asking Jacob Rees-Mogg whether the government is making the best of Brexit. I'll also be joined by Boris Johnson's former economics advisor, Gerard Lyons, to discuss Jeremy Hunt's decision not to cut taxes. And leading feminist Julie Bindle will be telling me why she thinks Nicola Sturgeon is a disgrace to women. All that and more at 9.30 tomorrow. There you are, lovely people. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. During late 2021, countless thousands of dead and dying crabs and other crustaceans washed up on 40 miles of the shoreline of the North East and North Yorkshire. Various explanations have been suggested for the event, described as catastrophic, including disease, a parasite, infestation or man-made pollution. But more than a year later, the government concedes the cause may never be known. Joining me now is Gary Caldwell, Senior Lecturer in Applied Marine Biology at Newcastle University, to reflect on what we do and do not know. Uh, and also with me is Joe Redfern, who's a marine biologist and a fisherman in Whitby, which is one of the areas that's been affected. Good evening, both. Good evening. Uh, first, first of all, um, just just to get to the you know to the heart of the matter give us a sense of the scale of the catastrophe joe yes over to me yeah uh, it's been devastating for our fishing communities you know especially those centered around the Tees estuary uh, you're talking 90% down in catch rates there's already uh, 10 fishing boats and fishing businesses gone up for sale difficult for vessels to keep crew uh you know and it's not only an impact to uh, the economics and their business but also to the well-being and mental health of the fishing community it's just a, a struggle to keep faith for the future um, when you're seeing scenes like that where hundreds of thousands of crabs and lobsters and uh, that make up the bread and butter of the income for the fishing industry are dead washed up on the beach gary what species were affected uh, there were mainly uh, edible crab and lobster, but there were also the, the common shore crab and um, some of the rebel swimming crabs, mainly the, the true crabs and lobster. So effectively the big crustaceans that you would see when you were going along the seashore or what you would expect to buy when you go into a seafood restaurant. And how long did the, I've seen it called a die off, how long did the die off last? Or is it still going on? Well, that's, it's quite a sophisticated question. So initially, it was a, a massive wash up of dead crustaceans over a very short period of time. And that sort of tailed off over the following month. And we think of that as the first really big striking die off that happened. Uh, but subsequently, you know, there have been smaller incidents throughout the year after that. But really, we're focusing on that initial big die off that more or less wiped out the local crustacean population. And, and what are the possible causes? I know there's been a lot of investigation, a lot of reports commissioned and written. Uh, what, are the, what are the likely, who are the likely suspects? Uh, so initially, uh, the CAFRA, which is um, uh, government's science body, uh, they blame the natural cause of a harmful algal bloom. Uh, the fishermen who are very familiar with the waters and the nature and the seasonality of the seas challenged that because it didn't quite make sense to them. And um, they commissioned their own report, which indicated that there could be a source of industrial pollution. And it's that point that we then came into the scene uh, with a group of three other northern universities and started asking that question, was an industrial pollutant part of it? And we narrowed that down to a single chemical called pyridine. And we engaged in a lot of intensive work trying to understand that, both trying to, to get our heads around the toxicity of pyridine to crabs and lobsters, and then trying to map how that pyridine would have been transported down the coast. Not subsequently, more recently, uh, another report's been released that has actually indicated that they believe there's a third cause, uh, which I think is a, a pathogen, a disease. However, in this case, there isn't the direct evidence for it, and they admit that in the report. Uh, so really, the, this third explanation of a, a disease phenomena or a parasite or a pathogen has no like, actual scientific basis. So we're still, as a group of universities, we're still asking more questions about the industrial pollution side of things and 
trying to tease a little bit more detail around that. Joe, as a fisherman, what's your what what uh, diagnosis or what decision do you come down on the side of? Well, it was strange when we saw the first wash-ups. Usually, when there's a wash-up on the beach, you can uh, point that towards a storm or, or some clear event. Where this was just such a like a mystery. Uh, you know, the people who have been fishing these waters for fifty years have never seen anything like it. Um, and everything, everything we've observed has been centered around the Tees estuary. Um, so we as a fishing community, you know, have looked always towards that Tees estuary as being the source. And also when we saw that first uh, big die off that Gary talked about, it coincided with a huge dredging operation in the mouth of the Tees. So the fishing community are convinced that it's come from that pollution. Um, and that's backed up by the science that's been provided by the universities. Gary, that sounds that sounds credible. You know, if if as uh, if, as Joe says, if, if people have been fishing, not noticing anything like this for you know five decades, then there's a huge dredging operation. It, it, it surely it does seem likely that some sort of pollution from from the coal mining industry or something that's been dormant in the sediment could readily have been kicked up into the into the water that the animals are in. I agree, and that, that's the basis that, that we've done our work. You know, scientists, everything we do has got to be evidence-based, absolutely everything, there's no room for speculation. And over the work we did, we've presented that evidence, we've collected the toxicity data for the chemical, and we think one of the key chemicals involved is a chemical called pyridine, which is a, an industrial chemical that has a very long heritage of release into the river, uh, both accidental and deliberate. And we've shown from our work that pyridine is very toxic to crabs and lobsters, much, much more so than, say, to fish, for example. Um, and so kind of that evidence uh, all stacks up because um, the pyridine can also be attached onto the sediment grains whenever the dredger releases the dredge sediment. And then that will be transferred down the coast, hugging very closely to the seabed. Good way to imagine this, Neil, is if you think you go into an eye club and they, they turn on that uh, dry ice machine and you've got that cloud of of dry ice hugging along the floor, moving along. And you know, that kind of situation where you're, you're a crab or a lobster on the seabed, you've got this cloud of toxic material very, very close to the seabed coming your way, and you can't avoid it. And this chemical that we are particularly interested in actually attacks the crabs from the outside. It doesn't even need to get inside the crabs to kill them. It attacks little receptors on their walking legs and the claws, which they use to track down food. And it attacks those and it overexcites the nerve cells. So it becomes a bit like a neurotoxin. And then it triggers them to go into a kind of convulsion. And they, they twitch and they convulse and then they die in a matter of hours. It's a very fast, aggressive death. Joe, what, what hopes of recovery? You know, you've got whole your families, a whole, a whole industry there, you're so badly affected. You know, what talk is there? Any talk of compensation or any redress for what's happened? <laughs> No, we, we, we've never talked about compensation. It's never been the drive you know, of the campaign from the fishermen to, to try and understand what happened has always been the first priority and to make sure that the pollution is, is stopped before there's any talk of recovery. You know, we, we can talk all day about trying to uh, rebuild the habitat or to rebuild these populations, but without stopping the pollution first, um, you know, it's, it will be a waste of time. And, and unfortunately, there's a new round of dredging to start on Monday, uh, which with oh, our most coastal communities are terrified is, is going to cause the same amount of death and destruction as we saw uh, in 2021. A dreadful, a dreadful story there, a dreadful outcome. Joe Redfern, uh, fisherman and uh, marine biologist Gary Caldwell, thank you for bringing that to us. And it's definitely a story we'll keep an eye on if, as you say, Joe, there's more dredging. Uh, to take place in the same area, but thank you for your time so far. Another break, after which we'll find out more about whether the government could soon force every one of us to have a digital ID. We'll be back in two minutes. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yeah, it's right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him.
There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hi, Andrew Pierce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. The special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello again, welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. The theme of tonight's show is proposed changes to our lives the government is hardly going out of its way to let us know about. First we looked at fluoride and drinking water, uh, which will be a surprise to many. Next up, plans to give us all a digital ID. The question is, what would it mean for the way we lead our lives? Critics of digital ID say we are potentially looking at nothing less than a digital prison. Joining me now is Sandy Adams, who has been researching the topic for several years. Sandy, hello. Hello, Neil. Good to see you. How all-encompassing is the proposed digital ID that's that's being discussed? Well, it's it, it's it's very very um, it's a con it's almost like a, a control mechanism, if you like. I mean, I, without you know being too uh, too too dramatic about it, um, this. Really, is a it's a it's a means of of collecting data um, by your digital ID. Your digital ID is your face, really. Your facial recognition will unlock everything that you need to access: goods and services, bank accounts, whatever. And we're about to enter the zero trust world, um, and that is really quite scary because you're treated as a criminal before you've actually unlocked your computer, looked at your emails. So the assumption is that you are a baddie. You're a baddie. Until you prove that you are, in fact, a baddie. Exactly. Good... You have to prove that you are it's, you know, guilty you know, before, before the trial. So, um, and, and that zero trust world, uh, really, um, it, it means that you, in, in order to access all these goods and services and, and everything that you normally access in a free world, you won't be able to because you, you will have to authenticate all the time. And whilst that authenticating process is going on, uh, of course, they are collecting your data. That is the reason for the authentication, is that they're collecting your data and selling it on to government departments, you know, and they've been very honest in this consultation. They've said, yes, it will be shared with the Cabinet Office, you know, with, with um, uh, DBS and uh, various other agencies. I think it's DEFRA. Um, but you know, they're not being totally honest because there's stakeholders underpinning all of this. So your data will be sold on to stakeholders in this whole stakeholder capitalist thing so, that's going sold on. Sold on as in money changes hands? Well, yes, it's, it's, well, it's, it's actually on the blockchain. It's tokens on the blockchain. It's, it's a different kind of currency that nobody really understands except the, the techies. And it's, it's currency that is, is generating tokens on the blockchain where impact investors get their rewards. Now, I wouldn't have known that this was happening, that this was being proposed if you hadn't told me. Yeah. Why isn't something that is so <laughs> all-encompassing, it's such a big change, why aren't there information films on the television, you know, round the yeah. clock, updating us on this? They don't want you to know. Mm. Uh, that's the only reason I, I can I can honestly. I mean, there, and why would they not want us to know? Because it's detrimental to our rights and freedoms. 
That's why. And they don't want us to oppose it. And that's why this is so hidden, this document. This is, for, for anybody that's watching, it's the consultation on draft leg legislation to support identity verification. I mean, they couldn't make it longer. So you have to put that in the search engine. And at the end of the day, you've only got a very short window to fill this enormous word salad in, really. Emma, you had a look at it, didn't you? Yeah, you I mean, I've, I've filled in government consultation forms like this before for mm. organisations or as an individual. And even just glancing at this before coming to the show today, it's so unnecessarily convoluted. You have mm. to dig through it yes. to, to find out exactly what they're getting at, what they're proposing, what the purpose of all of this is. Um, it's, so, it's so confusing that even somebody who has experience in filling in a consultation form like this would probably find it confusing. Mm. Yeah, let alone any sort of normal person who stumbles across it if they're lucky. Well, how much of the infrastructure is already there? You know, you talk about facial recognition, mm -hmm. you know, in, in terms of the cameras that will do this all around us, I know they're on the phones and on the screens, uh, is, is it all there waiting it's for a It's all there. Light? It's, the infrastructure is there. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, you may have noticed that in your supermarkets now, the human tills are going and you've got these self-service tills. Well, with those self-service tills comes facial recognition. Mm -hmm. um, and all the time, and, you know, and when you're making those transactions, uh, so they're tracking and tracing everything you buy, where you go, where you go out at night, where you drink, what you do. Uh, they're tracking your, your, your um, financial transactions. And all that data is available to anyone at the moment because I mean they'll say oh no we you know we we we're, we're keeping the privacy down but you know they haven't actually done done a risk assessment of privacy and, on and this we've all heard about the chinese model of uh, mm. of surveillance and social credit score so it's not paranoia, is it? It's not no. conspiracy theory to say that if no. there's the will in government yeah. to transform this into something whereby your behaviour online can be a mark against you or in your favour, that's not conspiracy theory, is it? No, no, it's all the facts are there. And it does seem that, you know, we all know we're, we've, we've all been debt slaves. This is a transition into identity slavery. So that, you know, if, if you... If you don't have it, and it, it's changing the economy. This is a form of currency. You know, the, the, the digital economy is the circular economy that they're, they're creating is actually a, a form of currency. So what they will do is um, they'll, you, you will be given your carbon credits. And when those are, are done, when you've, when you've expired them, maybe you've bought too much whatever, they don't like meat or whatever. Um, you know, the biometrics in the supermarkets, and there will be biometric doors eventually, that's what Tesco's are looking at at the moment. You know, those doors don't open if your facial recognition oh, no. links up to your I digital you ID. I to buy some loo paper. Ingrid. Or <laughs> Ingrid. <laughs> Ingrid. <laughs> Who knows? Ingrid. <laughs> Depends does, what the digital do, footprint, the yeah. carbon footprint When you is. listen to this, when you listen <clears> to the brave new world being described, what do you feel? Oh, I, I feel absolutely horrified. It, it's, it seems like sci-fi, that we're sort of like we're part of the sci-fi cast. Mm. Um, what they're saying as well, which I find absolutely pathetic, it's all for our convenience. Yeah. So we don't have to kind of keep giving the information each and every time. So it's a, a one... What's it called? The new... Uh, the something one... Stop whatever it oh. or whatever it is. Yeah. So once you've done it, it's like, oh, you don't have to think about it ever again. It's all for our convenience. It's such lies. Uh, so I say, same thing with privacy as well, mm. because this is yes. a, they say they'll, they'll, it will protect your privacy, but the absolute opposite is true. It's I, a need to, I, need to to, I need to go to a line, an official line here. The government has launched an open consultation into the draft legislation, and people have until the 1st of March to give their views. Uh, Alex yes. Burkhart, who's the parliamentary secretary for the Cabinet Office, said this government has made a commitment to improve the way that data and information is shared and used across the public sector to deliver better joined-up services and exceptional outcomes for our citizens. Mm. People often access government services in times of great need and services must provide the best possible experience for users while maintaining privacy, trust, building confidence. The government is due to publish a response to the consultation May the 24th. It's easy when you say it fast. It is, it? Mm. it is, absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, they haven't, unlike the census where they were putting, putting it all out on breakfast television and everything, there's been nothing said about this. They do, really don't want you to see this. They've made it so complicated. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, there's 12 questions that are quite loaded to... Uh, and it's almost as though they're assuming that you're going along with this, you know. Sandy, we're going to run out of time. Such Sorry. an important topic, though. 
We will come back to it in the days and weeks ahead. There's lots more to come between now and eight o'clock. I'll speak to a man who's trying to help tackle the obesity epidemic among children. We'll be joined by the head of an online school who explains why he's a big fan of remote learning. And tonight's Great Britain is a three-time world champion in the ultra-competitive sport of pie-eating. See you in a few minutes. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fungary debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's <laughs> on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live on GB News TV and on radio. On the way before eight o'clock, the head of an online school tells us why remote learning is the way forward for thousands of children. There's advice for parents who want their kids to turn their backs on junk food and eat more healthily. And on a similar theme, we'll be joined by the top chef who's teamed up with a food bank and I'm told she's got some samples for me to try. That's all after the latest news headlines brought to you this evening by Ray Addison. Thanks, Neil. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. 276 Flybe staff have been made redundant, with the airline going into administration for the second time in three years. Around 75,000 holidaymakers have now had their bookings cancelled. Flybe returned to the skies last April after collapsing in 2020. They were operating flights to 17 destinations. The head of the RMT union says its members will decide by the 8th of February whether to accept the latest and final pay offer from the rail delivery group. Mick Lynch says discussions will be held with members across the country over the next 10 days. But he told GB News he does not feel optimistic. What we've got is a really poor offer. The pay offer is below less than half of the rate of inflation over these two years. Inflation is running over 22, 23 per cent in the retail price index. This is 9% over two years. And we had no offer for three years before that. So this, our people are getting poorer, and at the same time, their conditions and their working lives are being trampled all over. So I'm quite uh, suspicious about what's going on, and I don't know if our members would be prepared to accept it. Graphic body cam footage has been released in the United States showing police in Memphis beating a black man who died three days later. Now, a warning. Some people may find the following footage distressing. Gary! Mom! Mom! Hey. Gary! 
29-year-old Tyree Nichols was kicked, punched and pepper sprayed as he cried out for his mother. Five black officers have been sacked and are facing murder charges. Tennessee State Representative G.A. Hardaway says we need to improve police vetting. These are folks who we are giving permission at their discretion to take your liberty or your life. We've got to do a better job of deciding who has that authority. Well, staying in the U.S. and former President Donald Trump has started his campaign for re-election in 2024. They said he's not doing rallies, he's not campaigning. Maybe he's lost that step. Uh, we didn't. I'm more angry now and I'm more committed now than I ever was. Cause... Mr. Trump speaking there at a Republican event in New Hampshire in his first campaign speech. Several party members decided not to attend or claimed to have scheduling conflicts. Mr. Trump's next stop will be South Carolina, which is also seen as a kingmaker state. And tributes are being paid to Claire Drakeford, the wife of Welsh First Minister Mark Drakeford, who died suddenly this afternoon. The Prime Minister is among those to pass on his heartfelt condolences to Mr Drakeford and his family. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, and the Prince and Princess of Wales said they too were sending their thoughts and their prayers during this difficult time. We're on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Back now to Neil Oliver Live. Thank you, Ray. Welcome back, everyone. More and more, we're bombarded with information about what we should and shouldn't eat. Imagine my surprise last week when I read scientists had decided eggs might cause heart attacks. As someone who eats so very, very many eggs every week, I was certainly surprised. Mm. Every parent knows, though, that keeping kids on the healthy, straight and narrow can be a challenge as well. My next guest, Alex Goss from the Adventurous Eating Team at Teach Your Monster, joins me to offer some sage advice. Uh, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Cool. Nice to, uh, nice to speak to you. How are you now? I'm good, I'm good. Now, are kids, are our children as likely as 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 us parents to fall into bad habits over Christmas? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, if you've got sort of what you could call junk food or sweet treats around, then they're very tempting for us and obviously very, very tempting for the kids as well. What are the basics then of keeping kids on healthy foods rather than following their noses and their natural inclinations? Yeah, it, I mean, it is a real, really big challenge and this challenge is as old as the hills. It's something which parents for generations have struggled with. Um, the, the general advice that we would give um, is it really starts with role modeling. So if in your home, your children, perhaps you will eat at the dinner table together and they can see you enjoying fruit and veg, that, that's really where it all starts. Um, trying to keep junk food out of the house as much as possible, um, not turning it into a forbidden fruit, so to speak, um, but you know, just making sure that it's not just widely available. Um, and when they do try those things, which might be unfamiliar to them, or um, perhaps they've said previously, I don't like it, like an onion or a mushroom or something, um, just giving them a tiny bit. So just sort of encouraging gently them to give it a try. And it's OK if they don't like it. Is, is, we've always thought in our, in our house that round the table has an enormous impact on everything to do with eating. We always find that, you know, everything from conversation flows naturally, you get opportunities to catch up with each other's day and life. But it, it yeah. definitely encourages everyone to eat the same thing rather than splitting off and, and following their own desires. Yeah, and it, it's, you know, it's something which we do see less and less. And it doesn't work for every family, you know. Um, families can be, you know doing one thing one arrives a bit later um so it's not always possible for all families to eat together um it is conducive for a good 
sort of healthy, nutritious diet and um, a time for the family to not, you know, just to enjoy the food together. Um, but even if they can't do that, um, that's not to say that we shouldn't be trying to get more fruit and veg into kids' diets, how, however you're eating it. Ingrid, how did you get on with your kids when it came to, all the, you know, the perennial challenge of, of keeping kids interested in the right kinds of food? Uh, because we ate together, and that is actually key to it. And we ate good food, good healthy food. I'm a terrible cook, I have to say. No, I am, and I really, really hated doing it, but I would not go down that road of buying even good pre-made food, because I knew there would be additives there. Actually, the children used to love aeroplane food that everybody hates, they said it's better than <laughs> mum's cooking. But um, I did that, so they grew up with, with good um, eating habits. Um, I think what's happened since then, bearing in mind my age, more and more women are working and they're tired. And they don't. They come back from work, they don't have time to cook or prepare meals and everything. So it's all about sort of forward planning, which they could do. You know, everybody could contribute. Men are more um, are better in the kitchen than they ever used to be. Um, so they are tending to go the easy way out. And then you get the just plain lazy people that just can't be bothered. So there you are, have a bag of crisps, do this, do that. And, well, look at Jamie Oliver. He tried to show people what went into the fast rubbish food that they were eating to put them off, well, which was brilliant. But they're still eating it. Emma, we find... My wife cooks all the time. She, you know, she, we, most of the things that my kids eat are cooked, you know, from scratch. But we, it's that round-the-table thing, yeah. and eating together. Did, did you... Was that part of your growing up? Um, not so much sometimes. And I think, um, so I don't, because I, I don't have children myself yet, but I was once a child. Uh -huh. And um, I, to begin with, wasn't, or so I'm told, a picky eater. I'd eat anything. And then I was left alone with my grandmother once. And that, I think, has a lot to do with expectations. So if somebody tells you, you don't like that, no, you don't like that, or, um, or, or babies you and doesn't have the expectation that you'll just eat everything, I think that makes a huge difference. And I do think the social aspect, regardless of the healthy eating, I think that that is so important. And, um, you know, even with my close friends, that us getting together every week and sitting around the table is a really important part of just living a healthy, rounded life, never mind the food aspect of it yeah. and I think particularly when you have young children at the table with you and they engage in conversation with you and they're part of it they're not sat on their iPads you know not engaging and with the TV adults suppers, that's another I horrible think, thing they're not eating I think it's, it's important for food to be part of an you know an overall healthy rounded life in order to have that good relationship with food Alex I think you can see the strong message coming out here is that this is the importance of um, you know people eating together families eating together and that, that if it's, if it, whatever it is you're trying to get your kids to eat, if you're all eating it together at the same time around a table, it's more likely to happen, is it not? It certainly helps, absolutely. Um, it's one of the things that we'd recommend. Um, I think it's also important to remember the, the, the science behind what we eat as well. Um, as humans, taking it kind of way back, we are predisposed to sweet and calorific foods. So if they're going to be available, even at the dinner table, then children will make that choice to say, do you know what, I'll have that sweet yogurt instead of that banana or that orange. Um, so, so that's one thing. And then on the, on the other side, when it actually comes to trying fruit and veg, um, it's so easy for us as adults to forget that opening a raw pepper and seeing the seeds inside is something that many, many kids haven't seen. And to know that strawberries actually grow on a bush is again something which not, not all kids will have seen. Um, so starting with simply looking at food, understanding where it comes from, giving it a sniff, um, and then getting to a bite is something which allows kids to just feel a little bit safer and a little bit less scared about food. And that's yeah, kind of so what we've tried. We're so disconnected, game. aren't we? We're so disconnected from the reality of our food. You know, I think that you're, you're right about, you know, vegetables and what they, what they are, where they come from and what they look like before they end up on your plate. But, you know, with, with the animals that we eat as well, you know, people just see uh, meat as something that comes, you know, shrink-wrapped <laughs> and bloodless. 
and we're not, we're not, you know, we're not confronted with the reality of an animal that's had, you know, a life and then becomes something that is our food. Yeah, absolutely, completely agree. What about to ban or not to ban? You know, when we, when we, when when we, when our kids were very small, there was this constant conflict with other, uh, not conflict, but other parents did it differently, and there was a lot of banning going on. You couldn't have uh, that fizzy drink, or they couldn't have certain things, and the those kids really, really wanted them like, <laughs> you know, they were like heroin addicts d d denied yeah. their, denied their next hit. We didn't <laughs> ban, and our kids were pretty cool. Mm. about the whole thing. They, they, they knew they could have it and they often didn't bother. Yeah, um, as, I, as I said earlier, Neil, banning can create that sense of like forbidden fruit, excuse the pun. Um, I think the, the thing which I think is key here is to try and make fruit and veg uh, a little more fun. Try and, you know, like I say, talk about it um, and just have it around the, the place. Um, and that's what we've tried to do with that new game, Adventurous Eating, as well, um, is just bring it to life and just make it something that kids can just engage with and, yeah. you know, open up a tomato and see the seeds inside. A lot of kids haven't seen a watermelon and, and what that looks like inside. So just yeah. trying to give them that safe place to play with food is important. Ingrid, I know a lot of, not everyone has the opportunity to do it, but, you know, for example, we, we my wife, grew, we grow a lot of our own stuff, mm. you know, a lot of We did, we had and, kitchen garden and everything. And got, you know, we've got apple trees and so on. Mm. And it, it does make a difference when the, when the kids see that, you know, with you know, apple juice that's actually come from apples. Mm, yeah. It's a great deal more excitement than, than just a carton of apple juice. Definitely. Well, we had a kitchen garden when we grew up with children, so it was lovely. We were foraging almost. And then, of course, with Norway, we'd go into the woods. We learnt the, the mushrooms that were poisonous, the ones that were safe to eat and things like that. Mm. And there's a huge joy in that. We fished the fish. It was all very fresh. But, you know, in amongst all this as well, it's, it's, we don't have, or this generation, don't have a healthy mind mm -hmm. because they don't exercise either. So that it's like food, it's exercise, it's all getting kind of like a balanced lifestyle mm. that incorporates all of that. And um, I think that we're fighting a losing battle. As you say, I mean, as he, as he was saying, they don't know what a watermelon is because there it comes in like a little clear container. A little cut it's got a, Yeah, with a little <laughs> pineapple inside and they don't know what a pineapple looks like. Yeah. The psychology of it is just all wrong. Mm. But look at the Mediterranean countries. You know, they're not obese. And we Because it's all around the table. Something specific has happened here to mm, us. And markets, us. they see the food and they pick and they squeeze and they touch. But in a way, I think that children are... The, are victims of the sort of society that we've created where parents have to go to work, they commute long distances, they mm. might not get home until very late, it's difficult to feed yourself if you've got a, a routine like that, never mind to feed a child. You know, single parents as well, increasingly atomised households. So there are all of these different factors and children's eating in many ways, is a sort of victim of that. Mm. But it's so much cheaper, though, to whatever make happened... your own. So if they could just plan ahead... Whatever happened to the phrase, didn't your mother teach you not to play with your food? Now it sounded like playing with your food might be the might solution. Be the, <laughs> might, be the, <laughs> might be the so solution. Uh, Alex, are there, is, there ground, is there ground for hope? You know, uh, Ingrid says, you know, the, the game is up, the, the game is lost, we've drifted too far away from, from food and, and understanding of diet. Or are, is there light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, uh, Neil, it, it does feel like an uphill challenge at times. Um, but with the research that we've done as uh, as we've made the game adventurous eating, um, we've seen that by using um, what's called a, a multi-sensory approach, it's called the SAPARE method, which is basically kind of gobbledygook for just use all your senses to try food and just have it widely available to just explore fruit and veg. Um, we have seen changes, positive changes, um, just by becoming less scared and braver of these plants that, you know, uh, at the end of the day, they are plants, they're, they're edible plants um, that they might not try before. But just by kind of becoming really familiar with them and having a bit of fun and going, oh, do you know what? I don't, I don't like that, or I'll, I'll give that a lick. And then the next day they give it a try. And before you, you, before you know it, they eat the whole thing. Um, we, we have seen those positive steps made um, just recently since we've launched the game. Some kids are now saying, do you, do you know what? 
can I try that thing that my monster tried? And they're getting new things on the shopping list, whether it's an aubergine or a courgette, um, which previously they had no interest in. So that kind of vicarious playing through their monster in the game, they've then ended up saying, actually, can I have that in real life? Yeah. Emma's right, playing with your food, that's the solution. <laughs> <laughs> Get them hands on and playing with it, that's the way. Uh, Alex Goss, thank you so much for uh, turning our attention to such an important topic, the stuff of life, food. Now, the closer we get to it in the healthiest way, the better. Another break, though, after which we'll meet this week's Great Britain, a man from Wigan, the home of the pie eaters, who is the newly crowned world pie eating champion. See you in three. Monday to Thursday, 9 pm till 11 pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio, and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 pm till 11 pm on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes. Now. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Kerr. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even on ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. He's the king of breakfast TV, and he's back. Eamon Holmes, back on the TV Surprised with me this even morning. even remember my name. No, it's been four months. Oh, you have holy water by your bed? Oh, yes. Oh, Already to bless. Yeah. Oh, Eamon. Oh. Why, why do you not believe anything I say? <laughs> Eamon Holmes, back on GB News Breakfast at 6 a.m. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us. Across the entire United Kingdom, we cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. On Mark Dolan tonight from 8, it's the People's Hour, in which I'm taking your video calls. Can the Tories save the economy? Is gambling overly criticised? And are the police still keeping us safe? Plus, is it wrong to go on holiday without your kids? We've got tomorrow's papers, my all-star panel and my take at 10 monologue, as well as Dolan's diary, my look back at the week's big stories. That's Mark Dolan tonight from 8 till 11 on GB News. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Now, disruption to our children's education is never ending at the moment. After months of lockdown school closures across a couple of years of COVID, now we have rolling strikes. What's to be done if our youngsters are not to have their futures permanently compromised? New government guidance says homeschooling can help in, quote, exceptional circumstances. But my next guest, Hugh Viney, CEO of Minerva's Virtual Academy, an online school, 
says that rather than the exception, homeschooling is actually the very best option all round for thousands of children. Hugh joins me now. Uh, good evening, Hugh. Good evening. This is very, I, I love this subject. We, we, so we, do I. In our house, we talk about this a lot. E education and state and, well, fee paying school, whatever, has been a car crash recently, has yeah, it not? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but COVID, there were benefits to it too. There was an awakening um, from thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of families around the world, around the world and indeed UK, who realised for the first time, um, who saw for the first time their child was happy. Not happy because they weren't doing any work, mm. but, but happy because they enjoyed school suddenly. I don't know, I found my, my kids, especially my youngest, I found it very, very difficult, actually. How old was your youngest? He was, just... he was, let's say, he was probably 12 when all mm. this, 11, 12 when all this yeah. started. And the separation from school definitely affected him badly. And even though, you know, my wife was, was all over it and was, was aware of his curriculum and, you know, and was on top of it, he found it very difficult to, you know, sat in front of his computer screen to try yeah. and engage in such yeah. a different way. He's in the majority, absolutely. The, 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 the press was correct. Homeschooling was hell for most families does for that reason. Does it make a difference, though? It does. Um, and from studies show from about 12 upwards, it's more effective. But what I'm talking about was a minority of kids, but a significant minority, about 20% of kids, who until that point had just suffered at school. Um, families such as yours, you have three children, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, the eldest son thrives at the school, the younger daughter thrives at school, but the middle child, for example, has hated school for five years. In COVID, they, they just loved, loved learning again. And parents were realising up and down the country, wow, is there another way? Is homeschooling legal? That was massively Googled, you know. <laughs> um, 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 homeschooling, my company would come up and they'd call and say, oh, I've discovered homeschooling. Can, where, does it, where do we start? Where do we go? I want to homeschool my child. It then gets a bit more complicated, but that was the awakening I'm talking about. So, obviously, there are people out there who just take it into themselves and yes. just, they, they, they are the teachers. Yeah. But you're talking about something which is a combination of the two. I mean, you're, you're leading from... There are several types, yeah. yes. Um, our online school is actually... The, 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 the buy-in and combination of the two from the parents is actually making the parents making sure the kids go to school, make sure they get to their desk, also making sure they're healthy and eat well. So that does go back on the parent. Unlike mm -hmm. at school, you hope you can trust the school to, to have that sort of responsibility. But what I'm talking about actually is online schooling that covers everything. And good online schooling does everything you should expect from a good school. Assembly on Monday morning with the headmaster, live lessons with amazing teachers, um, pastoral care with mentoring one-on-one, -on -one, you know, once a week. And then great, really, really great, best in class digital learning, which normal schools, traditional schools, sorry, um, my, my PR always say, don't call them normal. <laughs> um, traditional physical schools, mainstream physical schools don't have that tech necessarily. So what I'm talking about is a revolution in online schooling, which does everything you need, that a good school would do, including social, which is always I was a worry. I going to say, does yeah. it, do you, because uh, obviously there's a, an assumption, I think, that, the, that your child is on their own, really. Yeah, yeah. But is there an opportunity for kids that are, that are earning, learning online with you to interact with one another and feel that they're part of a class? 100%. Yeah. So, so community is huge, really important for our school and other good online schools. They have live lessons with teachers and their peers, interaction. They have after-school clubs in art and entrepreneurship. They have social rooms online. And I know some parents would be sitting here going, God, but that's still online and that's... But I'll, I'll come to that in a second. I will address that. But they are socialising every day and engaging with their peers every day. And good online schools go further. At least once, sorry, twice a term, they're meeting up in person. And those social interactions are incredibly strong. Mm -hmm. Now, also, if you choose this online schooling route, you're advised to join local clubs in the area near you, sport clubs, drama, uh, music. So loads of our kids are thrivingly sociable. Um, they, just, they just attend school in a different way to the mainstream. Emma, if, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming here that you went to school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Left your house in the morning, came back in the afternoon. Does this, would it have appealed to you, do you think, if you could put, take yourself back to that, you know, when you're 10, 11, 12? It's hard to say, I, I think, 
I think that this, so I personally it wouldn't have for me by the way it wouldn't um, have worked for me <laughs> I I, per I personally am very in favour of homeschooling mm. I think that it should be protected I think that it's a very good thing I part of that is because I I, I like the idea of having control over the curriculum to some degree mm. and to escaping some of the nonsense that you see happening in schools it's in the news all the time. Um, but obviously one aspect of that is is the social side. I think probably I would have struggled with the isolation mm. of what and, and and probably I think a lot of students will probably su suffer from you know issues with discipline mm -hmm. and maybe it would make children more disciplined if they were more in charge of you know making sure they're sitting down mm. and being engaged. Um, but my concern would be that the social aspect that you know a lot of a lot of kids spend a lot of time on on screens anyway yes. um mm. we saw during covid the profound impact of not having that social engagement so mm. even if you have an assembly mm. it's now i went to a, a deaf primary school and we used to sign all of our <laughs> hymns <laughs> and you know i don't think that you would get that you know that feeling of being in an assembly going in in you know lining up all of that aspect mm. of it singing songs and the sort mm. of a, the profound and more rounded sense of being in a social atmosphere that I don't think you can get online mm. and I don't I, I even though I personally if I had children would would seriously consider homeschooling because of the control it gives you I would be concerned that the social the la the, the, the sort of social deficit is something that is very difficult to make up for just in terms of joining some clubs in your local area or meeting up once uh, every term with your peers in, in, yep. in a physical location. No, I completely it's, a, agree. It's, a, it's a difficult balance isn't it even for, no matter how well intentioned you are as a as a parent and no matter how cooperative and in, uh, involved, engaged your child is. It's still difficult, isn't it? As Emma says, that how do you how do you make sure your child is being rounded off by, you know, having the rough edges rubbed off by <laughs> others? Yes, I would think so. Well, the thing is, I've got quite a lot of experience in this thing because my grandson was um, 15, rising 16 when lockdown happened, and he happened to be with me. And I said to him, "What do you want to do? Should I get you home to mum, or do you want to stay? Because obviously he wasn't going to go to school, so he wanted to stay." So I thought, OK, fine, this is good. You, I'll be in my office at my desk and he can sit opposite me at the other desk and if he needs any help, he can just shout. Now, this was very different. Um, they were given, they were set work mm. to do and then they had to submit it by certain dates and everything. So there was no, no presence, no virtual presence. Now, he found that really hard. So then he was... So I sort of became the substitute teacher guiding him and steering him. And I found it a bit hard. I think that had there been the teacher there, mm. now I could say I could on my other experience, my granddaughter has just started um, homeschooling with the teacher online. Um, I think it was probably September, so it's all very new. And it is absolutely fantastic. So straight away there's a difference between having the presence yes. of a teacher there and being left to your own devices. So if you haven't got a parent that um, is particularly clever or doesn't have the time, that child's going to suffer and not going to benefit. So the balance, there's a lot of balance that comes to it. And one thing is you've really got to question yourself. Can you provide the backup and can you also provide the time to make up for the losses of um, um, social interactions mm. by arranging, specifically consciously arranging um, events, um, swimming, um, going to the park, meeting up with friends that you wouldn't perhaps do, especially at an old age where you don't really do that. You don't have play dates like you did when they were little. No. Um, so it's very individual and it takes a lot of conscious you, thought. Something that occurs to me, the teachers that you have, are they drawn to being teachers in a virtual academy? because they are dissatisfied with oh, regular a school. Or... 100% teachers from the private and state sector have been flocking to the online schooling sector. Because what does it give them? Um, flexibility, like, like any job that, that, that is mm -hmm. um, attracted to the virtual environment or remote working, flexibility, shorter hours, um, you know, more control of their life and they can... and, and, and less paperwork. We're so tech savvy online schools that so much is automatically marked data is automatically tracked so 
you know, lots of teachers who do these incredible jobs are so fed up fundamentally that they can't teach anymore at schools, mm -hmm. right? You hear this a lot, and there's this exodus happening. Mm -hmm. Lots of that exodus is to the benefit of the online school market, which I'm not saying is great. I, I support all teachers, but you, yes, you, it's interesting. Do you think, though, that maybe, you know, having an online school is almost preparing people for a different job market. Mm. It's preparing people for this kind of remote working. Mm. Whereas, you know, whether or not that is what the future holds, if you're a child who's used to going out every day at a certain time and coming mm. back, then going into a physical job in an office, it, you know, going from online schooling to a physical job in an office will be quite a stretch if that's not something that you're used to. And it's a, it's a, as I was saying, you know, it's, it's profound what we learn from social interactions. We don't really fully understand it. And I just, I just wonder whether you can ever compensate for that and what you're doing in terms of, you know, possibly hampering people when they go into the workplace mm. and how they engage with others yeah. and social learning. Mm. How do you get around that? that does, Emma makes a point there. It, it does seem to be pushing people or, making, or drawing the people that are more inclined to be home workers. Well, firstly, fundamentally, it's about choice. Um, and until very recently, uh, or if you count recently, there's one choice for parents. Unless you have money, you can go private. There's one choice, and that is the traditional state school around the corner. Mm -hmm. It's 30 kids looking at a whiteboard with a teacher at the front giving More a lecture. More than 30. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And what online schooling offers is just an alternative, and, yeah. and that's good. We should have more alternatives. We should have choice. We talked about that with um, the, the topic earlier. Um, and the question you talk about with the socialisation, the missing out on that is absolutely true. Online schooling is not good for the majority of kids. Mm. 80%. So it has to be a very considered decision. Um, there's children with, with severe mental health issues exacerbated by the queue to the lunchroom, exacerbated by the playground. Mm. There's the counter argument, oh, won't they just get worse if you're taking them away from that? Shouldn't they learn resilience? Mm. But actually, after four years of bullying and mi being miserable, don't you want to take them out from that environment? Yes. Make, make them yeah. feel better again? And many of our children who come to our school for, for mental health reasons, they mm. finish their GCSEs, and guess what? They go back to physical colleges for sixth mm. form, for their BTECs, for their A-levels. Can so, I ask you something? It's choice. It, um, just, uh, this is kind of like the sinister mind working. Um, <laughs> I mean, and this is a contradiction itself. It's the work from home. Um, is this another way of just introducing the concept of being, working in isolation, being in isolation, that it starts now sooner, so that it becomes mm. a, yeah. a very natural transition uh, into work from home, because we are to... into isolation, are It is a good we? point, but we're running out of time. Hugh oh. Viney, CEO of Virtual Academy, it's such an interesting topic, mm. and you're right about choice. I absolutely bag anything that adds choice into into the mix. So thank you very much thank for this you. evening. Thank you. thank you. Another break, another break, always a break, uh, after which we can finally meet this week's Great Britain. This world pie eating champion. Oh, yes, he is. I'll be back in three. <laughs> I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like... comedians. Yes, <laughs> right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Let's spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice, 
We are here for you on radio, television and online. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi, Andrew Pearce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. With special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every weekend, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Bigger and better, starting at 8pm Friday and Saturday. Can't be too safe. Bring it on. Has there ever been a more innuendo feature? And Sundays, we're on at nine. It's ridiculous. Just, just get on with it. Yeah. Maybe you should get a proper job. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome back once more to Neil Oliver Live. Tomorrow on GB News, we'll bring you an exclusive interview with former Leveling Up Minister Simon Clark. He's told Gloria De Piero that some Conservative MPs should have given Liz Truss more time. She lasted to just 45 days as Prime Minister last year. It is for colleagues, ultimately, to, to judge their own actions uh, and, and whether they uh, got behind their leader. But I, I do feel, and still feel, that uh, people owed Liz more loyalty and more time to deliver what was something which, as I say, she had won the argument on during the course of last summer. Simon Clark also spoke to Gloria about his battle with agoraphobia. You can hear at length from Clark, plus interviews with former Conservative Party Chairman Jake Berry and former Labour Minister Alan Milburn in Gloria Meets. That's every Sunday at 6pm. Moving on. There's only so much that a well-rounded individual can be expected to hear about healthy eating. Every now and again, we all want to be reminded about the gut-bursting gastronomic celebration of excess that is the World Pie Eating Championships. Yes, we do. My next guest has just munched and crunched his way to not his first title, not even his second title, but his third. Ladies and gentlemen, my next guest, all the way from Wigan, is newly crowned three times world champion pie eater, Barry Rigby. Hello, Barry, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Barry, you're not nearly the size I was expecting from the World Pie Eating Champion. Yes. Just, uh, it's got to be done, hasn't it? Yeah. Just, a, just, a regular, just a regular individual you look there. Tell me all about it, Barry, bit by bit, if you will, the, that, that, that triumph that you've uh, experienced for the third time. Oh, it was a uh, good down and then uh, it's just on the table. And then you're just getting ready to pick it up out of the foil tray and just uh, eating it as quick as you can. Little what? chunks, big chunks. You know why? And then what? it's just uh, try to eat it all as quick as you can without what? spilling anything. What sort, what sort of pie was it for the pie purists watching? It was a meat and potato pie. Oh, a classic, yes. And, and what was your winning time? Uh, 35.4 seconds. Unbelievable. Now, I believe the trophy in question has a rather good name, if you could remind us of that. Yeah, it's called Bradley Piggins. Bradley Piggins. It's a, it's a world unto itself, really, isn't it? The World Pie Eating Championship. It's, it's something quite special, I would say. Oh, yeah, it is, yes. What, what, attra on, on the map. What, attra what, attracts a, what attracts a person to, to an event such as this? Where on earth do you get the idea that uh, eating a pie faster than anybody else in the world is really your forte? Uh, I've always been a fast eater. And because it's local to me, I thought I'd go down and just uh, have a go and try it. Yeah, but not just once, not just twice, but three times you've, you've achieved this. Yes, three times I've achieved it, and I've entered about 15 times now. <laughs> I didn't know that. 
You've done this 15 <laughs> times. Yeah. That's, br that's made my night. Do you taste the pies on the way down, or, or is each one really uh, just an enemy to be knocked over? Uh, yeah, more like an enemy to be knocked over. I didn't really taste it this time, but I tasted the crust when I couldn't swallow it. Nearly says to choking. Fifteen times. That that is my takeaway from the whole evening. That does does the meat and potato pie play to your particular pie eating strengths, or or would you have had another flavour combination that would have made it easier for you? No, I think uh, I think that one is quite easy to eat. To be honest with you, the meat and potato because it, uh, it's very soft inside. It does try and go down very quickly. And 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 on the previous on the previous fifteen occasions, has it always been a meat and potato pie? <laughs> no, he's had different varieties. He's had chicken and veg, and that went all over your hands uh, yes. and all over your. It wasn't. It wasn't very good. And then he's had puff pastry, flaky pastry uh -huh. on the pies. But yep, it's yep. mainly minced beef and yep. uh, onion oh, as well. No, no, you've, you've reminded me. I, there was a there was a sound recordist that I, I used to work with when I was making a different kind of television called Jamie Flynn. I wonder if Jamie Flynn's watching. And we we talked often about a, a show that we wanted to do together called Pie of the Day and Pie Talk because we were great pie aficionados. So I, I speak to you with some enthusiasm for the pie as a concept. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely interested in what you're talking about here. But I, I also need to ask, what is your technique? You know, for people aspiring to be world champion, what, what is the best way to approach this? The uh, best way to approach it is by holding it in two hands. Well... And then just make sure when you're eating it, you don't drop anything on the table or else you're into the competition. And then small, just keep having bites, small bites, chunks. Lots of small bites or just a few big bites? Yeah. Which? Uh, small bites I'd go for, really. And small chunks. And I, I, again, again, how do you prepare beforehand? Do you put yourself on a starvation diet for the week before? Well, uh, no, I don't, but I had an empty stomach when I went down to the hiking competition. And because I was slightly off camera, when I finished and won, put my hand up, they said, can, you ask, can I ask a favour? Can uh, we eat another pie? Do I have to eat another pie straight away with the reporters there? And then when we were finished and went outside again with the cameras, can you eat another pie outside as well? I ended up eating three pies. Absolutely sensational. I talked earlier tonight, Barry, about crickets and other bugs being turned into food. How would you feel about a cricket pie? Uh, not really, no. No, I uh, I think I stick to something what I'm uh, used to. You and, me, you and me both, Barry. Barry Rigby, uh, three times world pie and champion, and tonight's Great Britain. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that has been uh, the highlight of my evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're on to another break now, uh, after which a former MasterChef finalist will join us in the studio. Uh, and that MasterChef finalist has prepared some tasty treats. Don't go away. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there. From 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6pm, Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Welcome back. We're in a whole new part of the studio, which is very exciting. Uh, trust me, the irony of one two-hour show making room for a story about healthy eating for kids, another about the three times world pie-eating champion, and also a story about how to cook well on a stretched budget. It's not lost on me. Uh, but here we are, life's rich tapestry and all that. My final guests this evening are Deepa Chuan, uh, founder of the Burnt Oak Community Food Bank, and Daksha Mystery, a former MasterChef finalist. They're here to talk about uh, their how to cook video guides to encourage good eating with food available from the food bank in a time when food and fuel crises are making life hard for millions. Uh, good evening, uh, Deepa and Daksha. Now, you've got a, a, an, your own catering company. So this is the, the, the background from which you have come. Uh, and th these are samples of what's available. Now, it, I'm fascinated by this idea that it's, it's to encourage people who are on very, very stretched budgets, if any budget at all. Indeed. Yeah, so yeah. thanks for having us. No, no, um, thanks for having you. And, yeah, so at Burnt Oak Community Food Bank, we received a bit of funding from Barnet Community Innovative Fund. And so we reached out to Daksha Mystery, a BBC MasterChef finalist, and um, she kindly agreed to assist us in our journey with our clients accessing our feed bank, how to eat well. Because you don't think, everyone who, you know, when I, when I think about a, a food bank, it, it does sound like, well, it's, it's desperate straits in a way, and it, it sounds like a survival, really more than anything else. Mm. And the, but the idea that you can endeavor to have really nice, yes. healthy, but also exciting and interesting food, is, that's a revelation. If you come to our food bank, 89% uh, of what you see on our tables is fresh. Fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, uh, uh, as well as non-veg items. And it's really important because it doesn't matter where you come from. What's important is that you are able to eat healthy so let's and try. well. What, 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 have we, what have we got here? OK, <laughs> um, so basically all these ingredients you see on this plate are readily available at the Burnt Oak Community Food Bank. Mm -hmm. Now, all I've done is represented it in my way, obviously, being a MasterChef, BBC MasterChef finalist, uh, uh, presenting in a better manner is so much important for me. Yes. So, obviously, what you're eating here is a lovely piece of roast breast of chicken uh -huh. with a lovely jus. Okay. With char-grilled broccoli. It looks, it looks absolutely you got leaves, perfect. carrots, You've got sweet potato mash mm -hmm. and a, a lovely, lovely, beautiful peppers. So please enjoy. Um, yeah. I, I, I do hope it's still warm. 
<laughs> <laughs> but again, these are the vegetables, these are the ingredients that our clients pick up, but they don't necessarily know how mm -hmm. to cook, how to utilise these ingredients. So with our BBC MasterChef um, at Bentec Community Food Bank, we've created how mm. to cook guide video guides on YouTube, and they can follow Daksha. Um... And do they, though? Are you aware that people really are following? Well, basically, what we've done is we've done little videos on, on exactly how to cook from the food that's available at the food bank. So it's, it's on YouTube, it's, it's, uh, it's, on, it's on, on every uh, newsletter that we have that, you know, they can watch. So I think so because they, when they do come to the food bank, they do see, they do recognize me, and they said, "Oh, you're you're the lady on oh, on, on the video." Yeah. So they do recognize me, and they do ask me certain That's questions. Right. Those, how do we use certain ingredients? Mm -hmm. You know, so for example, celeriac is not a very uh, 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 vegetable that uh, most people mm -hmm. use. So I tell them that how to use celeriac. It's it's a very very nutritional value in, in celeriac and how to use it. I just tell them how to produce it. What's this dish here? Okay, so there we have a, a humble baked beans. Now, how often do you eat baked beans? At breakfast, uh -huh. yes. What do you do? Open the tin, <laughs> put it in a, in, a, in a saucepan and heat it up? No. What I've done is I've actually made koftas out of it. Oh, that's got a tip Oh, I yeah. love the idea and this of that. Is an actual, <laughs> actual dish that's got... Mm. So, basically, I've done two different dishes. I've done... Because we have... Uh, cultural mm. people coming to the food bank. So mm -hmm. what I've done, I've done a traditional dish over there that is a little bit of my fusion. And this is a... Because we get all, all cultures there. So this is uh, right. sort of like an Asian twist on baked bean. Basically. And is this, is this something that you would say, I mean, it's obviously for people coming to the food bank, but this seems to me to be something that people could, you know, you can create good food on a budget. This Indeed. is something that people yes. can learn for more widely. Yes. I love the idea of yes. baked bean coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. I mean, the baked beans, you, I mean, you wouldn't use... <laughs> the, the thing is, you wouldn't use the sauce. You'd literally rinse... You, you'd actually rinse out the sugar. So you think about yes. the nutritional value, taking out all the sugar, so using the bean, which has got the more nutritional value of the whole baked bean tin. It strikes me, when I was thinking about this, coming That's on to this, that all the best cuisines in the world, all the most famous, French cuisine, yeah. they are what they are because they're, they have their basis, their foundation in people who were having to take simple, accessible, cheap ingredients and make something wonderful from them. Mm. That's where you get the best cuisine, isn't it? It's that creativity yeah. and that inventiveness. Yes, right, yeah. I mean, you think, uh, I mean, uh, food was sort of like, people think the French food you know, that's where there was beautiful food comes out of French, France, I should say. But, you know, it's what you make of the food, what you make of the ingredients. It doesn't matter whether it be a humble ingredient, a humble sweet potato. I mean, you can make a beautiful mash out of it. Anything humble, you can make so much things out of it. As you can see, two, two, two different dishes yeah. from two different oh, cultures. Delicious. I want to take this home with me. <laughs> <laughs> Please do, because yeah. I have so plenty, delicious. plenty in the backyard, so you can... Please come and take it's so important to be reminded, though, that even even in straitened circumstances, you can make great food. Mm. You know, pe you know, people that are you know that are going to a food bank. Yes. I don't suppose all food banks are the same, but that that people can access that those ingredients and with a bit of know-how, you can turn out restaurant standards. Pe people are hugely wasteful as well. I, it, you know, pe people should, as a matter of course, be cooking good food and thinking about waste and the money that they're spending on that food. This is so delicious, you know, it and so people should be right. eating like this yeah. in, on a normal day. Yeah. You know? yeah, that's why we created this How to Cook video, guys, because we know that people go to food banks, they get home, they come out and they see all this, uh, you know, variety of foods. And when they come to our food bank, they're very incredibly blessed. They have a great variety. But when they get home, what do they do with that? What percentage goes into the bin? So mm -hmm. we put our thinking mm -hmm. caps on. We said, and okay. such a waste, having um, really been stuff. able to get the food in the very first place we've, is we've, a struggle. We've run out of time. Oh, no. Thank you both. <laughs> That's such an inspirational idea. Thank you very much Thank for you. that. Thank you for, our Thank you for having me. That's all from me on Neil Oliver Live. Thanks to my panel, Emma Webb and Ingrid Tarrant. I'll be back at six o'clock next Saturday. Next up, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Mark, what have you got for us on your show? Hi, Neil. Thanks for a brilliant show. Well, we pick up the baton at eight with the People's Hour, in which I'm taking your video calls right through until nine. We've got Dolan's Diary 
my look back at the week's big stories and my take at 10 monologue. Lots to get through tomorrow's papers as well. Uh, do email the show, mark at gbnews.uk. Lots to get through. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the